10 to 20% of the overall pledges we bring in. So when I'm talking about lookalike audiences, I'm referring to the demographics. So when you look at product design, on average, about like 20 to 25% of backers are new backers, meaning they've never purchased anything on Kickstarter before. So we're actively going out there in the demographics on those four platforms to find those people. Hey everyone, welcome to the Masters of Crowdfunding Podcast. Today we have a special guest. Um, typically we have our clients come on to talk about their journeys, their processes in launching their products. Today we have Noah Kinsey. He's the Customer Outreach Manager uh, from Jellup. And uh, for all of you that haven't heard of Jellup, um, I would consider them the number one crowdfunding and uh, Kickstarter advertiser out there. And so really a pleasure to have you on, Noah. And uh, Noah himself, he's a fellow founder uh, of other types of businesses. Uh, so really excited to have you on. Thanks. It's really great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Kevin. Pleasure is all mine. So I want to start out. I mean, you've uh, been at Jella for almost two years now. Actually, just a little context for everyone how this podcast came to be is we, um, uh, you guys had a massive booth at the Consumer Electronics Show a couple weeks ago, January of uh, 2024. And uh, you were gracious enough to um, share a part of your booth with LaunchBoom and uh, other uh, of your clients and creators. And then we also threw a uh, private dinner together with Kickstarter, the Kickstarter team uh, in design and technology, and also uh, yourself and your team as well, which was a ton of fun. The steak was incredible. Um, and uh, you were on the panel and you had incredible advice for um, entrepreneurs and product creators. So out of all these different um, products that you've been a part of and millions and millions of dollars of funds raised um, that you guys have been responsible for, what are the top three biggest mistakes that you see people make during the crowdfunding campaign, Noah? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and first, thanks for all those props. <laughs> I definitely had fun doing that panel. So thank your entire team for inviting me on. I'm glad I didn't embarrass you by having me up there for sure. Um, honestly, there are a lot of mistakes, but if we're, in my opinion, there's a few that are, you know, pretty substantial that we, when you're talking with us, we try and get in front of, um, so for one, setting your stated goal too high is a huge, huge thing. Uh, as you know, with launch boom, you know, it's all about like the reservations, the VIPs, all that stuff to build that funnel and all that, which is phenomenal and can and does make a substantial difference when you launch the campaign. The problem is sometimes that gives a false sense of pre-success, I'll say, where uh, if you do the math based on the VIPs and everything, it's easy to think you're just going to blow it out of the water automatically just by those efforts at the beginning um, without really taking into account the attrition rate or all of a sudden someone's lack of sense of urgency at the beginning. So sometimes there's this feeling of we don't need marketing at the beginning because we've got this. We're going to wait for, you know, a couple days, maybe let it die down. And sometimes you set your goals way too high, your stated goals. And yeah, if you're not hitting that and exceeding it early on, the Kickstarter algorithm is going to be your worst enemy. So you can just kind of really shoot yourself in the foot with that. Uh, another one mistake that's made is having a campaign that's over 30 days. So uh, we see this a lot with uh, repeat creators where spe usually like their second or third campaign where they say, wow, I made this much in 30 days. Can you imagine how much I'm going to make in 60 days? When the reality is the math is not on your side. While you might think it's twice as much as a 30-day, that is just not how the Kickstarter world works. That's not how the backer psychology works. And if anything, along with the lack of sense of urgency in a super long campaign, along with, again, that Kickstarter algorithm, it, you're just, you're probably making... I would argue you might make less on a 60-day campaign than you would a 30-day campaign. 
uh, especially, you know, and I tell people with how you're ranked, think of it as SEO. Uh, if you're ranked really low, let's say, you know, the final week, as you know, Kevin, the final week is going to be your second most active week after your first week. So if you're starting your final week, uh, let's say day 23, and you're rate 200, okay, that's, you know, that's pretty low, but you can slowly climb from there, but you're not getting meant much, if any, organic views. So imagine if now your, your final week is now day 53. Imagine if you were on 200 on day 23, how much lower you're going to be literally 30 days later. So that's a big mistake, and it's just, again, it's not in your favor because the Kickstarter ecosystem and the retail ecosystem are fundamentally different in so many different ways. And probably the last one I would say, and this is a conversation I've been having recently, is caring too much about having a high return on ad spend. So especially in the middle part of a campaign. So the whole point of a Kickstarter isn't to get rich. If you make a ton of money, mazel tov. That's phenomenal. But the point is, is to use it as a marketing tool, as a business springboard to get as many people singing your praise as possible. And on the marketing side, as long as we're at or above the break even point, we want to continue spending more to bring in more backers. So that's so like when someone says, well, I want a 5x, meaning for every $1 marketing spent, I have to make $5 in pledges to say I want 5x halfway through a campaign. Sure, I guess there's a possibility you can do that, but you're leaving so much money on the table and so many backers because there's an inverse correlation between ad spend and return on ad spend. So yeah, so when people are like, I want this incredibly high ROAS in the middle of a campaign, theoretically it's possible, but that is not going to translate to high numbers in your overall pledges after your 30-day campaign. Yeah, th those are fantastic points, Noah. I mean, just to add to that, the, the return on advertising spend in the middle of the campaign you also have, to, as a creator, you also have to think about the trickle-down effects of those customers too, right? Those customers that you bring in at, let's say, a, you know, even a 2x or a 3x, whatever your break-even point is, those people are going to trigger the algorithm to rank you higher and get you additional Absolutely. organic sales and traffic on the platform. And then that might trigger word of mouth or additional press or media coverage, you ranking higher on the platform. And those are people that even though there aren't the most profitable transactions, they're with you from the very beginning of your products. And, and if you do what you say you're going to do and you're transparent, you're decent with your communications, even if there are delays, those people are going to become your true fans. Absolutely. Right? So I think it is important. And actually in 2024, it's a year of focus for launch boom to talk about, okay, let's not just talk to our clients about launching a successful crowdfunding campaign. Let's zoom out a little bit. Let's talk about how you leverage a crowdfunding campaign to build a successful business. Because I think um, uh, product creators, especially first-time product creators, tend to have a, a less of a longer-term vision. Yeah, because I mean, it just by nature, creators are more creative. They're not necessarily business minded. So what you see, and I'm going to kind of zoom out a little bit because my background's business development is you hear the statistics about like, let's just say 75% of small business owners go out of business in the first three to five years of being in business and me dealing with those people. What I've learned is the reason why is a lot of those small business owners worked in that industry and wanted to be their own boss, but they were workers. They didn't, nece they didn't necessarily take on the business courses or things like that and how all the other areas of that business and the industry they worked in in order to be successful moving forward. So what you guys are doing now and what you guys have been doing about helping them taking them as like little successful Kickstarter baby birds and helping them like fly in the retail space is so fundamentally important because again, you don't know what you don't know. So 
having someone like you being able to help them take that Kickstarter success and pivot into a successful business model is just absolutely key. Yeah, appreciate that, Noah. So gel up um, $1.125 billion raised. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Over almost 4,000 projects. I mean, some of the biggest names out there in crowdfunding, peak design, or not just crowdfunding, some of the biggest names out there in direct-to-consumer brands, including peak design, is one of your clients. Um, talk to me about um, what uh, does Jellup actually do for people that are less familiar? Sure. So primarily, we run the live marketing during that 30 day or less campaign. Notice I keep saying 30 days or less because I'm like, you gotta do 30 days or less, no more than that. So we run the live marketing during that. We run it primarily on Facebook and Google. And by Facebook, I mean Facebook and Instagram, or if you wanna call it meta, which I'm old school, so I don't particularly default to that. And by Google, it's Google and YouTube ads. Um, even though Google and YouTube ads are about 20% of the daily ad spend, the majority of the ad spend still is on Facebook because people go on Facebook to find an excuse to leave Facebook. That's why ads and articles do so well. I'm from a small town of Michigan. I'm in LA right now, but I'm from a small town of Michigan and I equate it to the local library that has that cork board that has all the events happening outside of the library. That's what I think Facebook is. And so ads perform really well there. We also have an email newsletter that goes out to a massive amount of people. But I always do the disclaimer at the end of the day, it is an email newsletter. So it ends up averaging like 10 to 20% of the overall pledges we bring to you. So really it is about those live ads where we actively go out, look for the demographics um, that would be interested in their, their product. Awesome. Awesome. So when would you recommend uh, a creator to onboard with Jellup and start speaking with Jellup? And what should they have um, uh, prepared prior to working with Jellup? So I typically like onboarding them about four weeks out. Now, to be clear, we can onboard someone within two to three days. And we do that often when it comes to live campaigns that come with us after they've launched. Uh, but but the reason why I say about three to four weeks out, I'd say more like four, is because as a creator, you have so many different things that you have to do leading up to your campaign going live that it's ideal for us to get the ads and everything ready well ahead of time. So when that last week hits, we are one of the least things that's like you're worrying about that's on your mind. So uh, we create the ads from the creator's assets, any of their pictures, videos, GIFs, all that. So they don't have to have everything completely ready, including even their draft page. I always, we, I need that sent to me. But even if it's not totally done, that's okay. Even like towards the, towards the final week, we're going to give notes on the campaign page to suggestions to optimize it that the creators can decide if they want to utilize. Um. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. And also another service we do, but it's not for everybody. We do, we have started doing like pre-launch marketing the last two weeks or the two weeks leading up to your campaign. But I mean, for the live marketing that will, that's our bread and butter. That's our thing. But for the pre-campaign, we're a little bit more selective because we want to, for both of them, we want to make sure that we're going to be an asset to the creators for one because we want it to be successful but for two since we're performance based meaning we don't take any money up front we want to make sure that we feel confident that this is going to be financially productive for the creator because that helps us as well got it got it that's awesome so um for anyone looking to launch a crowdfunding campaign definitely recommend uh you guys to reach out to noah and uh the gel up team um two to four weeks out for the launch of your team. yeah i'd say four weeks but even if they someone has questions ahead of time as they're constructing their campaign they can always reach out and i i have a lot of meetings after ces or gen con or all these different things i have a lot of meetings with people who they might not be launching something for four to six months but having a at least like a preliminary discussion helps them in the construction of their campaign and better educates them 
So I want to empower people. I'm a really wordy person in case listeners can't tell because I'd rather people have too much information than not enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, there's so much uh, arbitrary steps that's uh, in the roadmap of launching a product that it's incredibly um, valuable to have someone like yourself guiding a, a founder um, in in that position. Um, you know, a little uh, fun fact, actually, my second campaign that I ever launched uh, was in 2015, and I was actually a client of uh, of uh, LaunchBoom, but also Jellup. Uh, oh, nice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, with the EcoQ, the, the one that you see right here. Right oh, cool. Um, so Jellup helped me advertise and, and helped me uh, scale my campaign to over $375,000. Wow, that's incredible, man. Congratulations. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I think I was speaking with Gil at... Um, at uh, the cocktail party that, that we had as well at the CES. And um, he said we, we might have been the first 50 <laughs> clients of, of Cello. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it, everyone listen, the like launch boom plus Cello combination has been incredibly powerful work ever since, you know, 2015, probably before that. And it still is. I mean, many of our clients... Uh, go through the testing optimization and then move uh, transition on to working with Jellup um, to scale their advertisements. So it's a it's a fantastic combo. So what is the secret sauce that Jellup has, Noah, that gets your advertisements to work so darn well and uh, your tracking um, to work so well? Because I know that's like been a struggle with um, most people that I worked with as a product creator. And most of our clients as well. I could, I think those are like the things that really differentiate you guys from everyone else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of different things. So for one, we have our proprietary analytics that we use. We A-B test 15 to 20 different ads from the founder's assets um, to see which lead to higher conversions. So that's part of it is with our analytics, we've been optimizing it. And even if maybe didn't work ideally for some creator or founder, I mean, I'll use your terminology here, uh, then because we're constantly fine-tuning it, even if they come back for another round, usually they end up having more success because we're constantly learning from our analytics and also the way it's hard for people to run their own marketing if they aren't doing it, I would argue, on a daily basis because both meta and alphabet they uh they move the goalposts all the time it's kind of like if if people go to their local grocery store and they notice the grocery store switched every aisle because they're trying to get you to like buy new things it's like both meta and alphabet are doing that on a weekly basis so even if you might have had some success maybe a month ago if you stop marketing during that time the rules have kind of changed, so it's really tough for someone to do their own marketing in that way. Uh, also, again, because we are performance-based, we do not take any money up front, and also we're not fronting the marketing spend. We do for typically for the Google, YouTube, the 20%. We'll front that and include that in the voice at the end, but for Facebook, we're creators, founders are, are uh, spending their own money on that, so... We So there isn't a guarantee for us, really, for any sort of income at the end. Other marketers, you know, that at the end of the day, you promise to pay them back for their, their spend no matter what. So for them, there's less of a sense of urgency. But for us, we're taking that very seriously with us being performance-based. We like to eat, you know? We at Jell Up, we like food. We like to be able to pay our rent. So creators founders have to be successful for us to be successful so we too feel that sense of earn you know urgency and ownership we're practically working pro bono for like two months before we see a dime so it's really fundamentally important to us existing for these campaigns to be successful yeah and uh talk about your uh newsletter and your audiences as well because from all the campaigns that you guys have launched you have quite a bit of data on 
which uh, segments of backers will do well, which audiences would do well for specific types of products too, right? Sure. Uh, that's not inaccurate. Uh, we do have our audiences when it comes to the newsletter. And because we are, you know, we've helped over 4,000 campaigns with people who've purposely opted into our newsletter because they liked whatever, whatever product that they got, they liked it and wanted to see more from us because we are selective and who we bring on. So they trust that we've curated something that's a good product. Um, and it does go out to a massive amount of people. Creators get mentioned, I think at this point, at least two times during their campaign in our news. They're featured, meaning it's about them. Um, and we do tend to, not always, but tend to uh, use a lookalike audience initially when we're uh, when we're marketing a product, something that we think is very similar that we've had a bunch of success with. So we assume maybe it's going to be that way here. But I mean, quite frankly, every campaign's like a snowflake. No two are the same. So we're still optimizing the results every single day. And I also want to be specific when I say look like audiences. I'm not talking about just the people who, who have historically backed those types of campaigns that we know of to us that established audience of people that we email in the email newsletter, that's low-hanging fruit. So that's, again, the 10 to 20% of the overall pledges we bring in. So when I'm talking about look-like audiences, I'm referring to the demographics. So when you look at product design, on average, about like 20 to 25% of backers are new backers, meaning they've never purchased anything on Kickstarter before. So we're actively going out there in the demographics on those four platforms to find those people. As much as it seems like Kickstarter backers have like Mary Poppins pockets full of all the money in the world, the fact is like they do have a budget. You know, they're they're not going to just, you know, they're not rolling in it necessarily. So we want to make sure that we're actively going out there finding new people that would be interested or be in the market for this. So we don't rely just on our established base of newsletter audiences. That would dry up super quick. Yeah, yeah. You're you're making the pie bigger for everyone. Mm. Sure. And and we've seen that time after time. Uh, what if you start running ads for two or three days for a product and then it doesn't work? Like you're not getting the right returns. What happens then? Sure. So when... You know, when the return on ad spend starts to starts to go down, uh, we do try and course correct, uh, whether it's shifting money more towards those ads that have higher conversions. Sometimes we create new ads uh, from new assets that maybe are similar to the ones that led to higher conversions. But at the end of the day, the thing that people need to realize about Kickstarter, it is a consumer based platform. Consumers need to perceive value in the campaign and they need, there needs to be a demand. It needs to be something that they definitely want or they feel solves a problem or a pain point. So sometimes they're just, it just isn't there. There just isn't that demand. Uh, so if that happens and if we can't keep it at or above their minimum return on ad spend, we'll suggest to pause the ads. And sometimes we'll suggest, let's revisit this leading up to the final week, because if it did well in the first handful of days, in theory, it should do well the last couple days. But there's times where we just, because again, we can't, we literally cannot afford to run you at a loss and neither can you quite frankly as a founder. So we want to make sure that we're optimizing and being an asset to these people to these campaigns. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. You know, you, you mentioned it in the beginning, um, when we first started recording the psychology and setting a lower goal in the Kickstarter algorithm. Um, why is it that the beginning and the end of the campaign tend to yield the best results you think? Sure. Well, so the sense of urgency and the fear of missing out, that's the primary motivating factor for Kickstarter backers. Uh, so at the beginning, the reason why you want to set a slightly lower goal than your true goal is for, to provide that social proof. The vast majority of backers who come to a page, the first thing they look at is that blue bar to see if it's filled out. 
meaning it's hit its stated goal that's on the page. Before, again, that's the first thing you look at before they look at anything else on the page, whether they come from our ads, whether it comes from their reservations, whether it comes from organic, that's the first thing they look at. And if that blue bar is filled out after like the first day or, or two, I would argue, then someone would say, oh, hey, this might be something I would be interested in. And then they look at the page versus if that blue bar isn't filled out all the way and it's two days into the campaign, people assume that it's not a good product, that they probably wouldn't like it, and they're going to leave before they even look at it. So there's that bandwagon mentality. So by getting to that 100% as fast as possible, you're providing that social proof and that assurance that this is a quality product. It's optics. It's sure you can call it lazy perception, but welcome to dealing in the consumer market. So it's, a lot of it is the optics before even... Like, how do you get in front of somebody? How do you how do you excite somebody before they even know what it is you're trying to excite them about? And that's a big part of it. Got it, got it. Um, I also want to talk uh, about the, you mentioned the true goal, right? We call it, you know, another word for it is the internal goal. Um, so you have the public goal that you want to crush in the very beginning for the reasons that you just described, Noah, so that people feel confident in backing your campaign, your conversion rates are higher, your advertising performs better. Then there's the internal goal. That's the goal that you want to hit in order to get, you know, reach whatever your uh, financial goals are or to, you know, pay for tooling or your first production run. And that's also why the um, pre-launch is so darn important too. You want to make sure you have a sufficient size audience and list to have the momentum necessary to hit that internal goal as well before you launch. And that way you can uh, continue to build your business, right? Going back to the idea of not just having a successful crowdfunding campaign, how do you develop and build a successful business? Yeah, I I agree. Awesome. Um, Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, Noah. Um, we talked a lot about the gel up and crowdfunding and live campaign advertising and you know audiences and all of that. Um, to uh, shift gears to you, um, you're a founder yourself. You're you're running uh, multiple businesses in addition to helping founders uh, launch their products. Um, what is, uh, actually, let's start with talking about, uh, what are some of the other things that you do outside of uh, helping launch their products? Sure. So I co-own a coffee company. Um, we just did our soft launch on the website this past year, spartacuscoffee.com, um, which I'm very proud of. It's not only is it uh, slightly less expensive than a lot of the brands you'd buy online, but it's also mission-based. So 5% of every sale of Spartacus Coffee goes to the nonprofit No Kid Hungry, which goes to uh, eliminate school lunch debt in public schools. It stocks up local food banks and also works to fight in Washington to just get rid of that gross school lunch debt concept anyway, because that's just terrible. Um, so 5% of every sale goes to them and we're opening our first brick and mortar, uh, in March in North Hollywood inside of a gym. So it's really exciting. Uh, the other business I have, I have a production company. I am a filmmaker as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been besides, oh, I say in addition to business development and sales for the past 15 or so years, I've also worked in the industry as a creative development executive, uh, production manager. And, uh, two years ago, I kind of decided I've been making all these other people look good for 10 years. It's time to go out on my own and start my own production company. So launched that in 2022, at the end of the year, we filmed our first short film that as of this past May, we've been on the festival circuit, luckily winning a lot of awards and getting a lot of really good reception for it. And we'll be done with the festival circuit uh, the end of this summer, finishing up in San Diego's film festival. Um, and then during this, because of the success of it, we've started pitching other projects to studios. So in 
a decent sized nutshell. Those are the two businesses, other businesses that I have. That, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I wanted uh, definitely for you to talk about it. I was uh, doing some uh, homework prior to this uh, interview and uh, IMDb, nine wins and nine nominations. And I haven't even updated that yet, so it's more than that. And well, that's just for me. So for the film, we were, I think we're around 20 wins and about the same amount of nominations. But uh, yeah, that's just for me as director, writer, uh, producer. So yeah, incredible, incredible. Um, so, I mean, you've had a lot of achievements. You're running businesses, starting businesses. You're helping other uh, founders and creators launch and scale their businesses very successfully as well. It just seems like every time you go to bat, you're hitting a home run. Like, can you <laughs> share a story where maybe you... It was like a horrible failure or a mistake where you ultimately look back and said, wow, like that really shaped me positively down the line. I mean, I'm glad that that's the perception because that certainly is not the reality whatsoever. So uh, as it is for most successful people, and I don't even I'm not even close to where I want to be quite yet. We're on the right path and I'm very excited about that. And sure, it seems in the past couple of years, things have been turning up Noah, but um, no, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, failures out there. I've gone through, I mean, I'm not going to get into it on this show. I don't think we have the time or the emotional bandwidth, but I've been through really low lows. Like, I mean, I, there's been times where I've literally feared for my life for very logical reasons. So I have been through a lot uh but when and so even in so going to more of the product production space so i've worked starting out i came out to la with zero contacts in the industry which makes it incredibly tough because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out here and sometimes that crazy person that seems like they're in charge of stuff sometimes yeah they're eccentric and they are but other times they're full of it so dealing with a lot of those people and having to sift through a bunch i mean i've man i i've learned so many lessons out here um and you know there there's i guess a big lesson is everyone has to pay their dues when i mean that that spans any job everyone has to pay their dues but how long do you do that because out here in this town it's it's easy to kind of get caught up in that and just be used basically for for what it is uh, that that you do. I mean, I've had people who I've paid my dues to then try and offer my services pro bono to other people because hey, this guy works for free, and that's just not the case. I'm doing it to prove my value to other people, and I mean it's. Yeah, I've just, I've learned way more in my failures than I have in my successes. And I think with the failures and, you know, a lot of people wanting to put you in your place, uh, you, at some point, you have to really, you know, evaluate if you agree that that is your place. And more often than not, it isn't. More often than not, people who try and put you in their in your place actively are doing it because they're afraid that you're going to eclipse them, and that you're that they need you more than you need them. And by keeping you by suppressing you, they're keeping you working for them and making them look good. So I I, I think that's a big lesson: is really know your worth and. You know, and, and, and really try and find your path. There's a lot of different paths out here. That's another thing that's frustrating about the entertainment industry is there's not a simple textbook about this is you go from A to B. It's not like professional sports or whatever, where it's like you follow this specific path to get there. There's so many different ways and not every way is right for everybody. So you have to figure out what's right for you and maybe not be afraid to say no to certain things that just aren't for you. So staying true to yourself and not getting lost in this chaotic industry. But that also can apply to any industry, really. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the 
like the lows that you're talking about and those mistakes, I feel like it definitely applies to launching products as well, right? If you've never done it before, there really isn't that straightforward of a path. You can go in a million different ways, retail, distribution, uh, manufacturing, there's, you know, there's OEMs, there's, you know, you can white label, you can create, you engineer your own products, you can do crowdfunding, you can go straight direct to consumer owned website. Like, how do you navigate all of that, right? And I think Alex Hormozzi, he talks about, I forget the exact term that he uses, but it's like um, educational debts that you have to just pay down to get your education. But then you can also have a consultant or a coach or an advisor that helps you expedite that as well, right? So anyway, the what, what you were talking about, um, I think it's extremely relatable to actually me as a as a product creator myself um what's what is your process in like dealing with those th moments where you know in your words when someone's putting your place or a lot of times like in product launches you you have a couple of days of bad data in your advertisements right and you put yourself in that place uh sometimes like how what is your process to like work through that and and what would you tell you know founders uh, and product creators, how to work through that. Uh, I think it's important to take a step back. Uh, I am as guilty as anybody of kind of getting tunnel vision and being so deep in something that it's it's easy to kind of lose sight of the big picture. So I think it's really important to take a step back and be more analytical of the over, like the overview of what it is going on, what, where you came from, what you've been doing, you know, what, what maybe can be adjusted. What's an, what's an issue, like what's a critical issue versus just a minor annoyance? Because sometimes when you're in the thick of it, everything is at a 10 when in reality it really isn't. So, uh, I mean, I hear about, I've heard, I've read articles recently, like in the dating world about what's a red flag versus an ick. So you can really use that in the business world. Like what's a real problem versus something that just isn't great and you're not a big fan of, but really isn't going to derail you unless you focus on that versus focusing on the problem is the problem. So I think really being able to take a step back and taking inventory um, even if you don't feel like you have the time, you have the time. If anything, I would argue you don't have the time to not do that. So that I think would be what I would recommend. How do you do that, Noah? Are you writing this down? Are you going out for a walk? Are you talking to a friend? Like what are you, what is it you're doing? Cause it's like you said, like you're so laser focused. You're so in it. It seems like the end of the world to you. And I've been there before, <laughs> like, but in that moment, it is the end of the world, right? Like. What, what do you do? How do you break out of that? So it, it a couple different things. For one, for sure, I step away from my laptop because that thing tells me all of my problems. It reminds me, this is a problem. This is a problem you're facing. And if I'm still staring at it, I can't step away from it. So uh, I get off of my laptop. I don't let any electronic distractions. I'm not watching TV. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm just stuck with my thoughts, which is always terrifying. Like that's, that's never a comforting thing where you just experience silence, but that's where at least for me, I find the most mindfulness. Uh, sometimes if like, if I'm at the gym and I'm on the treadmill, I won't listen to any music. I'll have my noise canceling AirPods in or earphones in. So I'm not hearing the gym's music. And I'm just stuck in my thoughts and I'm itemizing things. So I try and just step away from the problem. It doesn't have to be for very long, but just getting away from it being in my face tends to make me be able to look at it kind of with a wider lens. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So really just um, disconnecting a little bit for at least a short period of time and, and sitting in silence in your thoughts. That's fantastic. Um, what are some things that you do regularly that upgrades your mental well-being, your body, your health? I mean, the gym is a big one for me. That's kind of my my meditation sanctuary. Um, I want to meditate more, but sometimes like it's hard. I'm an overthinker, so my brain doesn't like to just not think. 
Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think probably my biggest one would be the gym is going there and just, you know, finding a place outside of where my direct work is to just disengage and just recenter myself. So if people aren't gym goers, at least find something, whether it's going for a walk, doing anything that there's no distractions or anything like that, and just try and recenter yourself. Fantastic. What is one book, article, movie, or piece of content that you would recommend for a product creator to read or watch? Oh, that is a really uh, good question. Um, I am going to throw something out on, from the left field that even before I read it, I would be shocked if anyone recommended it. I'm going to look at my bookshelf real quick because it's right there. Yeah. So it is Rick Ross. He wrote a book, believe it or not. His lyrics of his songs are nonsense. However, his book is called <laughs> The Perfect Day to Boss Up. This book is phenomenal. Um, again, and sometimes he does have his lyrics in the book, which even as you read him, I'm like, I don't know why you think this is wise. Everything else in this book is gold. Your lyrics, they just don't make any sense. Um, but that book is is so good. It's about him being an entrepreneur. I didn't know how many wing stops he owns, which makes sense because he raps about wing stop all the time. Um, <laughs> but like he is this entrepreneur and his mindset uh, is really admirable. Um, still not going to listen to his music, but I, if he writes another book about being an entrepreneur and motivation, I, I count me in. So that, I, I, surprisingly, yes, I'm recommending a book by Rick Ross and you can be shocked by that i would be if i hadn't read the book but i'm telling you read it what is that mindset that you're talking about that he writes uh in the book so we uh, so one of the things that stands out to me is he talks about focusing uh you know he, he, because again he has so many different business endeavors and as do i so it's important to learn and just in general honestly another book would be robert kiyosaki's rich man poor man but that's a boring answer because probably a lot of people are going to give you that answer but from that which is the reason i read rick ross's book is the concept of surrounding yourself with people who are further along than you because they're going to help educate you and inspire you to move up instead of kind of dwelling with people i don't want to say on the same level but people who if you're motivated you want to be around other motivated people because just people who aren't motivated, they're, they're not going to light that fire under you as someone who is where you want to be. And in that book, one of the things he talks about is if you have all these ideas and things that you want to do, you can't really do them well all at once. So focus on one, master one, get that one up and running before then you like diversify your business portfolio. So just being more mindful in the approach you take to your business slash businesses is is huge because I'm the type I have. I mean, there are other businesses eventually that I'm going to launch, but I need to make sure my production company and coffee company are healthily on their feet before I move on, because if they're not solid, then the more I add, just the weaker everything's going to be across the board. So true. I mean, it goes for product creators as well, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we tend to be tinkers. We keep making new products. You got to make sure the, the the product is successful first before you launch another one. And then you make that one more successful. And actually that the first one will make the second one more successful. Yep. And finding those distribution channels and getting your advertising cost dialed in. It's, it's so true across the board. Focus. I think focus is everything, honestly. Yeah, agreed. Okay, last last question for you. What is a best purchase or investment that's, let's say, under, you know, three hundred dollars? Let's say, uh, it could be more or less. It could be a, a product that you purchased, or a book, or I don't know, a mattress, whatever it is that you think gave you the highest ROI in your life. I would say when it comes to that low dollar investment that has made a significant difference in my life would be books, quite honestly. In, uh, you know, I grew up with parents that are really big, big book readers, 
and tried to instill that in me. And, you know, I go through phases of not reading at all and then being an avid reader. But for the last 10 years, I've read a lot of nonfiction, um, whether it comes to the entertainment industry, whether it comes to, you know, social issues, uh, a lot of different things to expand my mind and really make me think about things in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, again, it's a struggle. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely am not uh, a daily reader as much as I would like to be. Life sometimes, you know, just kind of grabs me and maybe I'm just not in the right mind and space for it. But I mean, I, I have more books than I've actually read because I keep collecting books that I know that will enrich me. And then when I get to them, I'm luckily right. So I would say that is huge. And probably the book that made the biggest difference just in general in my life that I've read multiple times is called Ishmael. It's by Daniel Quinn. And it is a book about, I would argue, like the human condition, about the the history of man and civilization. And even though it's more of a philosophy book, or it's written in a way that's kind of fiction, so it's not super dry, but that book I read first when I was in middle school, and since then, I mean, I've purchased multiple copies because whenever I let someone borrow it, when I recommend it, I never get it back. So I've purchased multiple copies. I try and read it at least once a year, and yeah, so I think that's made the biggest impact on me early on but also just really open my mind to what I can learn and how I can be a better person simply by reading and reading from different perspectives than I would have I think we're guilty uh in today's society of being in an echo chamber and really wanting to consume media and things that confirm our own bias or preach to to us as already a member of that choir and unfortunately I'm seeing a lot of people not really stepping out of that echo chamber where I think it's really important to kind of push through the discomfort and kind of put your ego aside about what you think you know and open your mind to other perspective other voices and yeah I think that just makes you a better person yeah yeah the ability to change your mind and you know actually you mentioned you have more books than you've read. Same thing here. <laughs> um, I almost treat books like articles. Um, so instead of like, you know, taking short glimpses at a bunch of social media posts, whenever I get book recommendations, I'm going to go ahead and buy these books that you recommended, by the way. And then I'll probably uh, listen to a part of it. If I like it, I'll keep going. If I don't like it, I'll move on to the next one. I'll listen to, you know, Rick Ross's book, and then I'll mo move on to Ishmael, and then I'll move on to another one. And sometimes it's, uh, I have so many books where I've only like read or listened to a chapter. Um, and then sometimes I will listen to a chapter, and then three years later, come back and remember that chapter and go, oh, like that was interesting and it's more relevant to me now. And then I finish the whole thing in, a, in two days, you know, or something like that. So um, I think because books relative to the value that you get is so cheap. It's like, 10, 15, 20 bucks max, right? And uh, even if you just get something very small out of it and and you have 10 books for 200 bucks or, you know, 300 bucks, whatever it is, um, you're going to get so much more value than the couple hundred bucks that you put in. So I, I like that. That's solid, man. Um, so any calls to actions for the listeners here, Noah? Um, where can people find you? Learn more about Jellup. Obviously, jellop.com, that's J-E-L-L-O-P.com. Um, any calls to actions that you have for the audience? I mean, they can email me, Noah, N-O-A-H, like the ARC, Noah at jellop.com. If they have any questions or want to have a meeting, whether it's a month before their campaign is going to go live or even well before that to really... I can do a deeper dive on Jellup and what we do and what they can do to, again, better position themselves and better position their campaign leading up to when it when it's time to launch is very huge because, quite frankly, especially for first-time creators, you don't know what you don't know. So, And there's a lot of assumptions people make 
that just are not the case on Kickstarter. So I like to just, you know, get rid of those assumptions as soon as possible because sure, a lot of things would be nice if that was the case, but most of the time it isn't. So I, I tend to take a more pragmatic approach in general in life where uh, while it seems negative, <laughs> where it's like, yeah, I mean, the the everything's stacked up against you. You know, I, I, there's so many creators out there. Kickstarter is huge. Like, you can't just plop a campaign down. It's not the Field of Dreams mentality where you launch a campaign and the floodgates of pledges open. You have to work for it. You have to invest in yourself. How do you expect people to invest in you if you won't invest in yourself? But... All of those like seemingly daunting negatives, the whole point of of how I operate both in my life and how I deal with clients is like, here's here here's how things are. Now, now that we've addressed this and understand what I call challenges, here's how you get through those challenges. I'm not just gonna say that negative stuff just to say that negative stuff. I'm gonna say it because you can't ignore it. You have to figure out how to work through it. And that's what I do. That's what we do. And just in life, I think that's what people need to do. It's so easy to give up by saying like, by being positive and being oblivious. And then when things fail, being like, oh, I give up. It's like, no, understand that life is kind of stacked up against you in general, but there's a way through. And that's the point. It's not, you know, I truly believe life isn't what happens, isn't about what happens to you as much it is how you respond to that, how you adapt to that to succeed and to grow. Like I said before, I have as maybe as successful as it's perceived I am, which I can argue for and against that. Uh, I have failed so many times in the past decade plus that, you know, I, I had to adapt and that's what we have to do. You know, those overnight successes really aren't much of a thing as people think they are so it's about getting th like weathering the storm and coming out stronger for it yeah that that's uh there's no better way to finish um and you know one thing that i do want to add to that is whenever we do you know testing and optimization in the pre-launch process with our clients i always tell them even the most successful campaigns when they come out of the gate very rarely do they come out of the gate like roaring you know it's usually like they're in this gray area where they're getting some reservations they're getting some email signups but their cost is a little bit too high and you just have to continue to iterate and work through it to get your cost of advertising low enough so that you can scale and work with gel up and launch um so no that's fantastic noah really appreciate your time today thank you so much for joining us on the masters of crowdfunding podcast and um, looking forward to ch uh, chatting with you again real soon, Noah. Same, Kevin. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and an honor to be on the show. So thank you again for inviting me on. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>